I really wanted to talk to you guys today about aging and embracing aging as a young woman, learning how to embrace aging, and then also learning how to embrace your physical beauty and learning how to do that from a non-attached space, a space that's not coming from fear, but a space that's coming from a deep space of reverence, devotion, and just like a, a joy, like an, an embracing and, a, you know, just um, a joy to embrace these kind of natural aspects of life, whether it's the beauty, whether it's the aging, and also understanding the beauty in aging. So I really want to just get into it today. And what I was inspired by for this video was that I was seeing on TikTok so much and it was really, really disturbing me there's this aging filter that everybody's using, right? And you're seeing how you will look as an older woman, usually like around like 50 years old and up is kind of where it's going. And the comments that I've seen from women about this aging filter have been so sad and also very self-deprecating and also disrespectful to not only the version of yourself that will eventually be that, but also to all of the women who are currently those ages, currently look like that, and all of the women who came before you and your ancestors. Like, it's just not... It's not a healthy way to be thinking. It's not a respectful way to be thinking to yourself or to others or to life or to God. And it's not your fault because we live in a society that has conditioned us literally to believe that we are only worthy for our youthful physical appearance and anything else doesn't matter. But we do have a responsibility to not allow society's ideas to permeate and dictate the way that we actually believe or the way that we actually feel about ourselves, and we have a responsibility to live as free and embodied individuals and to return back to our connectedness because really what this is is it's just a result of us living in a really disconnected society. I want to start off today with this little kind of like story that I just, you know, it's not a story, but it's something that happened in my life or something that I thought about um, a few months ago. So in last winter, around November, I was in Portugal and I thought it was going to be like hot in Portugal. Like, I thought it was going to be warm, but it was actually cold. So I was in like the beachy area and I was sitting on the beach one day. It was cold and I was had a sweater on and I was journaling, you know, on the beach, right? And I was by myself and all of a sudden, everybody on the beach is like bundled up. You know what I mean? Like it's all adults and we're all bundled and yeah, we're just all, it's cold, right? And then this little kid, he must have been six or seven, yeah, around like six or seven, he comes running out in like his boxers or like a Speedo or like some sort of very small, you know, swim short. And he was just running towards the ocean and his parents kind of like stopped him for a second. And I, I just was watching because it was happening right in front of me. And his parents kind of stopped him and he's like, no, like I want to go play in the ocean. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, this kid is going to go play in the ocean. The ocean is ice cold. So he runs into the ocean. He has this little like, what's it called? This little board, um, little like, it's like a foam board, like a... I forget, a little something board. And he goes running into the ocean and the ocean is ice cold and he just starts playing. I'm thinking he's gonna run out after like five seconds, but he starts just playing. And for like, I kid you not, like 30 minutes, this kid is just like jumping in and out of the ocean. He would like run back to his parents. I'm like, oh my gosh, he didn't even have a towel. Like he, I, to me, I would have been like, freezing like freaking out you know and um he runs back in he's playing whatever he just plays and he's it must have been i mean he's obviously cold the temperature is cold but he didn't care why am i telling this story the reason why is because when i saw this it just something clicked in my mind where i just said ah children are closer to god okay so what does that mean right so when we incarnate whether you believe in reincarnation or not right when your soul enters your body you are um still identified with you're more identified with the truth of who you are you're more identified with your soul you're more identified with union you're more identified with connectedness you're more identified with um god 
right? So you're less identified with the physical, with all this stuff that's happening here. And so as children, as they are children, they are still, because they're newly in this body, they're new, like this is, right? Like this is, <laughs> this is a little suit that I, my soul is in. This will die. I will not, right? So this, Sometimes I just look at my hands. This is not me. Okay. This is a little body that I'm in and I came into this body when I was younger when children are younger They're not yet fully identified. They're they're more identified with who they are They're more identified with union connectedness God their true nature the more time that we, it doesn't have to be like this, but the more time that we spend in our current society where we're so identified with the physical and we're so identified with disconnection and we're hyper obsessed with the physical, right? Not all cultures have always been like this. A lot of indigenous cultures have not been like this, but this is how it is right now in our modern day society. We are so identified with the physical that by a certain age, you know, and also there is a natural occurrence where your ego kind of starts coming out, which is fun, right? Your personality, your individuality in this little earth play, right? So as that starts happening, um, you know, you become very identified with the physical, okay? And the goal, though, that what you want to do is to become, because you can go back, become identified with God, with union, with connection while you are still in this body currently, right? But when what I realize is that when we are children, we have a more natural affinity towards it. We're more naturally in that space, that union, that lack of physical attachment. And it's the same thing when we are aging, okay? So as we get older, I would say like 60 or 70 up, like 60 up. And then from zero to 10, let's say, and then 60 to death, you ha are given a gift where you are naturally more attuned. You are naturally more in tune with God. Okay. So aging innately is a gift from God for you to remember yourself. The physical body starts to wear away, right? It's like you can't move your arm in the same way. I can't go and run 27 miles. Not that I do that right now. Don't know why I just said that. <laughs> I do hot yoga. So I maybe I could still do hot yoga when I'm in my 60s probably, but when I'm in my 90s, probably not, right? So you cannot do the same things. The limitations of the body starts to show. But the thing is, is that the body has always been limited. There's always been limitations of the body, but we've been so obsessed with it that we've just made it everything. And so what we want to do now as young women, before we get to the age where we're forced to remember that, hey, this isn't you. This isn't you. Hi, this isn't you. See, your body can't pick up things anymore. Your body can't walk a mile anymore. Your body can't bend over anymore. You're about to die. In this physical world, you're about to die. Before you are forced to realize that because you are aging, which it's a gift whether you realize that before or not, but before you are forced through just the natural cycles of life, it is best to recognize it now so that you can live, not recognize it, not just mentally recognize it, to feel it in every fiber of your body now so that you can live identified with God. Let's get into it, okay? So let's let's talk about that because that is very important for women because we are living, it's very important for everybody, but it's especially important for women because we are living in a world right now that is so hyper-focused on the woman's body. It is so hyper-focused on the appearance of the woman. We have women, you know, dying to try to look a certain way. We have women so obsessed with youth, so obsessed with the way that they look, so obsessed with the physical that they are just depressed their entire lives. It is only because you've forgotten who you are. It is only because you've forgotten your true nature that you are actually so, so, so obsessed with the way that you look, okay? With the with your youth, with this, okay? So, we want to exit from that now. We want to stop being so caught in those 
in delusion, in my practice, I'm in the Self-Realization Fellowship and my guru is Yogananda, so through my practice it's called Maya, which means illusion, separation, the play, like all of this, if you can't see through it, you're gonna be lost, it's called Maya. So when you're lost in Maya, you're lost. So what we want to do is we want to find ourselves, find the truth of who we are, find our connectedness to the divine now. Okay, and that is literally the only thing that will bring you out of this trap of depression and anxiety and fear and wallowing and grief about your physical body and the and the fear and also grief isn't bad. So let me just backtrack. Grief isn't bad. The fear about aging, okay, the disrespect, the the degradation of yourself. Of with aging the degradation of your physical body if you don't look like you're 20 years old or 25 years old or you know 20 you know 8 or 30 or whatever the degradation of your body as it ages and newsflash you are going to look like that <laughs> I don't care if you get a facelift which okay but <laughs> I don't care if you get a facelift I don't care whatever you will die you will eventually look what you are trying so desperately to not look like Okay, um, so let's let's get connected. Let's get connected. So let me pull up my little notes. Let me pull up my, my notes, ladies. So, so the first thing that we want to do is we want to start making, taking responsibility for our inner thoughts, our inner way of speaking to ourself. Because we are so, we're aware about society and the ideals that society puts out for us and how unfair it is and how awful it is, right? But then we actually take those onto ourselves and we perpetuate them, we believe them, we engage with them. I know that it is hard, but we do have to take responsibility for our own thoughts and our own neural pathways that we've created and our own brain. It is only when we can take accountability for it that we can actually change it. I remember I read this book, You Can Heal Your Life, uh, like five years ago. And it changed my life because it wasn't saying that you're not a victim to certain situations, right? Like, you are a victim to society programming your mind in that way. But what it is saying is that you have the power. What I'm saying is you have the power to change that. When we take responsibility for this, we say, okay, this is what society has given me, but I don't like it. And this girl over there, she's not living like that. She's not imprisoned in these societal beliefs. And this woman over there, she's not imprisoned in these societal beliefs. So why do I have to be? Why am I, why am I still sticking with these ideas that I don't have to stick with? It's an effort to come out of it, but it, the effort is necessary and important. And so for me, what I would suggest to any woman listening, I would suggest multiple things, and these are all things that I've done. So what I would suggest is prioritizing your spiritual practice above anything, particularly meditation. When you meditate regularly and deeply, you start to, that's why I said it's not just about feeling, like knowing, okay, this isn't my physical, like I'm, yeah, I'm a soul and I'm living this physical body, great, that doesn't really change how I feel, right? Like, I still don't like whatever is happening. When you meditate regularly and deeply, you start to actually feel in your body. I'll give you an example from a meditation the other day. It doesn't happen every time, but when you continually have this experience in your body, it re-regulates the way that your cells engage with you, it re-regulates your brain, it re-regulates your embodiment, it makes you in union, okay? If you continually have this experience, or even if you just have it once, it can like rewrite that for you in that moment. But the other day I was meditating. I was meditating probably for around 25 minutes, okay? And I meditate every single morning and every single night. Sometimes I miss my night meditation, let's just keep it real but I do try to meditate every night as well. And I would say I meditate every, two times a day, probably like four times a week. And then I maybe mess up on it and only meditate one time a day, um, three days a week. So um, I was in a meditation a couple days ago and I was in it for like 25 minutes and I got to the space. And I'm like, ah, oh. who you are comes online. And I start, I'm just like recognizing, I'm feeling, and it's just natural, I'm not trying to do it. Oh my gosh, I'm in a body. <laughs> this isn't this isn't me. These hands, oh my gosh, you know, this isn't me. 
I'm just in a body. You start to have some sort of space, at least, some space from your attachment from your body, right? And so when you have that little space, there's room and you start to feel, oh, I'm not this body. What? This is crazy, right? And you start, as you continually have that experience, it rewrites your embodiment. It just shifts you into a different reality. So prioritizing the way that you actually meditate and the practices that you have to take you to that space of oneness and unity, that is very, very important. And I recommend that the most out of anything is committing to your meditation practice. Now, the next things I would say is that you have control over your mind and your thoughts. So actually, when I, um, when I did the aging filter, right? Obviously, it's shocking when you see it because you don't currently look like that. And you're like, oh my God, this is really realistic. I'm going to look like that, right? So my first thought, my first thing was just like, a, oh, you know, like, wow, that's different, right? Like, whoa, you know, it's kind of like a, a shock. And my mind can take two directions. It could be like, oh my gosh, I hate that. That looks awful. Oh my gosh, that's terrible. I never want to look, whatever. I could go into that space. Or I can choose to go into, I, what I went into was, I love that version of me. That version of me is so sacred and holy and beautiful and wise. And I love to watch and see the version of me who has lived this life of wisdom and of love and who is committed to herself. And I love to see myself closer to God, closer to returning back to her creator, whatever. It's a choice though. Like it is a choice and you have to continually make it. Now it's as you continue to progress, I've been on my journey now for around like seven years um, and pretty seriously in the last like three years, very seriously, I would say in the last like four or three years, but it began like seven years ago, last three or four years, it's really, really gotten more rapid. Um, but, you know, so what I'm saying with that to say is that, you know, it is almost, it's now kind of my, my knee jerk response. I didn't even think, I, I said, <gasps> And my natural brain response is to immediately go into the positive. And that's just because I've rewired my brain. And my brain, I was super depressed before. Like I was not, I didn't used to just, my brain didn't used to work like that, but it does now because of the way that I condition my mind. The way I condition my mind, another thing that I did, multiple things, but one of the things I did was I stopped listening to any music that wasn't uplifting. And I know a lot of people don't like this one. And maybe I listen to one girl rap song like once a week, maybe. But I take it really, really seriously. And for about six months, of, like six years ago, for six months, I did not listen to one song that was not by a spiritual uplifting artist. And when I tell you when I came out of those six months, I was natural, that was the beginning of my journey and like I hadn't built really any tools, but my, my mouth was naturally speaking and I was just naturally responding in these extremely uplifting and positive ways because that was constantly what I was consuming. That to me is extremely important. So I would say like really be mindful of the what you're consuming and people are not mindful of what they're consuming. We follow a million influencers that aren't really bringing us any substance. That's another one I would say. As a woman, I only follow people that bring me some sort of, um, some sort of gift, some sort of, you know, something that I feel is uplifting, something that I feel is beneficial for my soul and my spirit. I do not follow one person because I think they're attractive, not one. I do not follow one woman because I think she's attractive. There's not one influencer account that I follow that I just think, oh, she's so beautiful, let me follow her, not one. The only people that I follow are people that are, you know, bringing a message that is nourishing to my soul. When we are only interacting with online content from the physical space, you are constantly reinforcing that the physical is the most important to you and you are also constantly bombarded with meaningless physical attachment or attraction 
for no reason. And for women, I find that it can be really, really disempowering and really harmful because you're constantly seeing beauty and when it's not nourishing to you or when it, it can be overwhelming and it's just not something I find to be beneficial. And so I would say, I only, f I also am very mindful of who I follow. I follow on Instagram around 90 people, on Twitter around 40 people, on TikTok around 100 people, and on YouTube I'm subscribed to around 10 people, 10 to 15 people. So I'm very mindful of the people that I am interacting with online because you're exchanging energy. But when you are choosing and when you are saying, the thing that I care about is somebody's essence. I'm not interested in, you know, the, just somebody's physical appearance. I care about their essence. When you start caring about that, it starts reflecting back to yourself about what you care about with yourself. When you are like, I care very much about the way that somebody looks and I don't care if they're, you know, not, you know, nourishing. I don't care about their essence. I don't care about this and that. I just want to interact with this person that looks that way. Um, I personally don't do that because I don't find it nourishing to my heart and my soul and my spirit. And we're con and I'm constantly seeing so many people already and so many beautiful people already and so much information already that I try to narrow it as much as possible and make it only people that are really nourishing to me. And it is possible that somebody just based on their physical beauty is deeply nourishing to you and you have to make that own decision and use your own discernment but really use the discernment that i only want to follow people or engage online with it accounts or content that is deeply nourishing to me and my soul what that looks for you is unique so that is something I would say is very, very important. Now, another thing, really choosing to engage from yourself to yourself from that space. So choosing to cultivate things about yourself and not obsess um, about the way that you look, I think that that is important. You have a responsibility to yourself and your future self to tell yourself and yourself now even that you love yourself and that version of you is worthy. The comments I was seeing were terrible. You have a responsibility to yourself, to your liberation, to your spirit, to your soul to honor that version of you. Honor her. Like that is disrespectful as fuck honor that version of you that is not respectful that is not kind that is keeping yourself trapped in the the exact societal conditions that you critique to speak to yourself that way is not okay and it's not acceptable if you want to be connected if you want to be free if you want to be joyful if you want to be in bliss if you want to be in a joyful brain and a joyful body and have a joyful existence it's not going to come from that space and i would say another thing that you can do is also check your friendships if you guys know me which a lot of you guys do that are following my youtube because i just started out with youtube hey guys but um i you know i was celibate for uh two and a half years or two years and intentionally single and during that time it wasn't just oh I'm not hooking up with anybody it was I am taking this time to completely rewire my brain and commit to myself and check my life and make a life that feels fulfilling for me and one of the things that I did was I stopped being friends with most of my friends at the time because I noticed I had a lot of going out friends or friends that, you know, that they were not really nourishing to my soul or they were hyper focused on the physical and I didn't want that. I wanted to be free and so I didn't want to be around people that were, you know, hyper focused on the physical and hyper focused on these things that to me I didn't want to care about anymore. And so I would say check the people that you hang out with, check the circles that you're in. Are the circles you in are that you are in are the people around you constantly reflecting back to you that your body is the most important thing about you, that your physical is the most important thing about you. If so, that's a problem, right? That you won't get free in that environment. So if you want to be free, that's something to consider. And I also want to talk a little bit now about my journey with embracing beauty. So I want to talk about kind of like the balance perspective where it's not just like, you know, detach from your body, don't care about how you look, you know, and then 
ignore your, you know, your physical. We don't have to do that, right? So what we want to do is we want to engage with our physical body, with our vessel from a space of love, reverence, and devotion, and not from a space of fear. And so for me in my journey, I don't know how it's going to look for you, but for me with my journey, I was really deeply attached to the way that I looked and my physical. It came from a space of fear because I, I didn't feel fully worthy inside. I didn't feel, I wasn't leading with my essence. I wasn't leading with my embodiment, which is something I like to say is to lead with your embodiment and lead with your essence. I wasn't doing that and I didn't really know who I was and I wasn't secure in myself. And so I was like, well, let me over rely, which is what everybody does. <laughs> let me over rely on the physical. And so for me, I was very attached. This is years ago, five or six years ago. Um, I was very attached with my physical body and thought that my beauty was everything or that beauty is everything. Or, you know, I was constantly just more focused on the way I looked. And one of the reasons I, I thought was real for me was because as a kid, I would get really bullied about who I was and like my beliefs and my opinions and the, the, the stuff I was bringing to the world and my thoughts and whatnot. And it was, I would get like death threats, like it was just a lot. And so I really heavily relied on how I looked my body, you know, my my pretty privilege, I, I, I relied on that really heavily because it felt like a protective mechanism. Like, they can say all these things about who I am and that hurts, so I'm just gonna rely on what I look like and and kind of over rely on that. And that was a space I was in and it became definitely dysregulated and I became attached with who I was, be, I mean, with um, my physical, I became very overly attached with my physical because who I was was constantly degraded and told that she was wrong and that, you know, it was making people uncomfortable. It wasn't right. It was wrong. I would get, you know, really like bullied for my thoughts and my opinions and standing up for others and like my beliefs and um, the leadership that I was bringing to the world and from a really young age. And so I was, I just kind of shut down and shut off and just over relied on the physical. So part of my journey was then kind of going into this space. I was not really focusing on getting myself cute. You know, I tried to get myself cute today. I try to get cute every day now. Um, I wasn't focused on getting myself cute every day. I wasn't focused on, you know, um, dressing cute or, you know, really playing with this little avatar um, human that I have here that I love so much. I wasn't focused on playing with her or dressing her up or having fun with her. I was just kind of focused on my healing and kind of almost like detaching from that a little bit. And after that period, that year or two or so period, I came to the space where I felt okay. I feel really confident in my knowing of who I am as the truth of who I am. I feel very confident in that. And so now feeling so confident in the truth of who I am, feeling like I lead with my essence and my embodiment and like I know that my essence and my embodiment is the most interesting thing about me and the most wonderful thing about me and I lead in every room that I enter and every interaction that I have with the truth of who I am and not with my physical. And so because I'm so secure and so confident in who I am and so regulated, and I've done a lot of you know trauma-informed work with therapy and a lot of you know healing intensive work and trauma-informed work. Um, and then also really devoted to my spiritual practice and, you know, really devoted to having really healthy connections around me. So my physical, my world all around me feels very safe now. And I myself feel extremely secure in the knowing of who I am and in my ability to show up very regulated and stable and safe and radiant in my essence. And so as a result of that, I'm like, okay, now I can embrace my beauty and my physical body from a space of love and adoration and devotion and playfulness instead of a space of fear. And when I was interacting before, maybe five years ago, I was interacting from the space of fear. I was like, I need to make sure that my physical looks like this or I, you know, I, I'm overcompensating because I don't really know who I am or I'm not secure in who I am or I don't feel built up in who I am. And that led to a lot of dysregulated ways of in, engaging with other people. And, and so now 
feeling so secure in who I am, I can interact from a space of, oh, I will, you know, um, do my makeup a little bit and I'm not a heavy makeup person, but I'll do my makeup a little bit and I will get cute every day and wear a little outfit every day if I can. And I will come to my body and my physical from a space of adoration because I'd like to adore every phase of my life. And right now I'm 25 and I would like to completely worship and adore and enhance um, not enhance, but embrace the beauty that I have right now. And when I'm 80, I would like to embrace the beauty I have then in whatever way I feel called. And so right now it feels fun and fulfilling to embrace my myself and my physical. And that's because I'm coming from a very balanced space and coming from a space of adoration and love. And maybe for you, you can come to that space right now with yourself. So when you engage with yourself, you engage with yourself from a space of love and adoration. And it's also a, a, a continual, it's a rewiring of your brain. It is not going to happen overnight if you're very deeply attached to your physical body or if you're very deeply attached to these societal beliefs. It happens over time and with consistency and commitment. Even something that you can do every day, something that I really like to do is I have written out affirmations. I also have an altar space, which makes it really, really easy to commit to my spiritual practice. So I have a little altar space with a prayer mat and a little um, like table thing, a little shelf where I have my pictures of my gurus and I have my um, you know offerings and my incense, and my crystals, and I have cards with my affirmations. And so every morning and every night when I go to do my prayers and my meditations, I also do my affirmations and whatever I feel like I want to act in opposition to, whatever thought I have that I feel like I need to act in opposition to, um, I write it down, right? And so something that I think can be really important is noticing, not running away from your thoughts that might scare you or feel, you know, oh my gosh, that thought wasn't, that thought wasn't good. Well, it's there. It's there. So acknowledge it, write it down, figure, wait, say, don't run from it. Say, wait, what was that? What was that thought? Oh, that thought said that I'm bad or I'm shameful or I'm this or I'm that or whatever. Let me recognize that because that's in there. If I don't recognize it, it's still going to be in there and it's still going to come out. So let me acknowledge it and let me act in opposition to it. So, okay, I have the thought, acknowledge it, embrace it, accept it. I have the thought that I am not worthy over the age of 50 or I am not worthy as I age, okay? Okay. Okay, that's there. Okay, let me acknowledge that. And then let me write out the opposition of that thought or the opposing thought. So the thought would be, I am worthy in every stage of my life. And you can do multiple to interact, to counteract it. So I am worthy in every stage of my life. I am beautiful in every space of my life. My physical body is not the most important thing about me, but she is beautiful in every phase. Whatever you want to say, right? and read them every morning and night for a year, for six months, whatever it is, read them and feel them and go into that space. Do you see how I spoke when I'm saying that? It's because I'm, I'm trying to evoke the feeling. So when I'm saying the affirmation, I'm saying, I am worthy in every space of my life. I say it with a little feeling, with a little soul, you know, <laughs> because I want to feel it. If I just say, I'm worthy in every phase of my life, that doesn't hit. <laughs> that doesn't hit, right? We want to feel it in our bodies and we want to re-regulate the way that our brains work and the way that our nervous system works and the way that our bodies are interacting with the world. So you want to feel into the emotion of love and gratitude and peace and union. And so that I think would be extremely helpful as well. And to stop caging yourself into these beliefs because it's not true that you, you don't have to believe it. I used to believe those things and I no longer do. And if the thought comes up, I remember the other the other month, a couple months ago, I had the thought, um, I had a, a thought like this, right? And I just noticed it and I expressed it to a friend, ah, you know, it's, it's odd, I had this thought today and, and this was something that came up for me and she said, ah, that is, you know, odd or, you know, I, I, I hear you and I understand you and I can hold space for that. And then I got to work, working in opposition to it. And just like that, after a few months of working in opposition, actually it didn't take a few months because for me, I feel like as you start to progress and your level of embodiment is more secure, things can happen a little bit more rapidly. So it was maybe after a couple days, um, 
I felt I, my truth was the new was the new thought. So it's interesting because life is really about the truths that you choose and the stories that you choose. And a lot of us just unconsciously and automatically choose unconsciously, but we do choose them, the stories that are told to us from society, from our parents, from our peers, from the people around us. And we, we then continue to choose those thoughts for the rest of our lives, most of us. What we want to do is we want to say, ah, there's that thought or that, that idea. Do I want to have that thought? Does that feel empowering? Does that feel good? Does that feel, does that feel like something I want to carry? If not, Get to work in opposition of it. Get to work in changing it. Notice the reasons that you believe that. Is it your lifestyle that needs to change? Do you need to commit more to your spiritual practice? Do you need to do affirmations? Do you need to, you know, remove yourself from certain situations? Do you need to do a, you know, a conglomeration of all of those things um, and do them in tandem? I think that, you know, I personally, I believe that all of these things need to work together, but, you know, don't run away from these thoughts. Acknowledge them and see if you want to believe them. It's not innate, it doesn't have to be innate, it is what society is telling you, but you don't have to choose to engage with it. You don't have to believe it. It takes an effort to rewire it, it takes an effort to reprogram it, but it's worth it because then you can be free. So if you'd like to be free, this is what I suggest. And you know, I want us to honor the women around us. And it's unfortunate because, you know, we are not honoring the phases of a woman's life. And there's, they say there's kind of like four or three, three or four phases of a woman's life where there's like, you know, um, the maiden, the mother, the wild woman, the crone. Uh, but the crone is that older woman who's wise and we're not honoring her. If we can't honor her in ourself when we think about her, it's, I'm sorry, but you're not going to be able to do it to a woman outside of you. If you cannot honor yourself at that phase, if you cannot honor how you will look, how you will be, how you will, your embodiment when you are 80, if you think that there is innately something wrong or disgusting or terrible about that, which is what I was seeing in all of the TikTok comments, you will not be able to honor and revere the women around you, the 80 year old women around you. You will not be able to hold them with reverence and true sacredness because you can't, you do not truly believe it. You do not truly see them that way. If you don't see it that way for yourself at that age, you don't see it that way. So you know, this is important. This is the healing of the feminine. This is the healing of womanhood. This is the healing of generational trauma. This is the healing of our society. And it's not going to come from society. It's going to come from us choosing to live radically a new life and living it. And that becomes the the world that we live in because that's the way we're viewing the world. And then we you know, expand that out, you know, by me sharing this with you or by me raising my daughter in that way, by me engaging with my friends in that way, by me holding space for other women and embracing them in this way, by me viewing other older women with love and reverence and respect, by me not, you know, viewing them as anything bad. Like, I felt so sad on TikTok, guys, because I follow a lot of older women. First of all, one woman that I love is named the Midlife Muse, Midlife Muse on TikTok. She's awesome. I really love her, but I also follow a lot of, I'm really into thrifting, whole fit thrifted always. Um, this is, well, this was from my grandma. This was from my grandma from Cuba. This, um, this little, it's a, a Cuban, um, church that's there. And then this is, I thrifted this gold, um, secondhand. And then this chain is secondhand. I got it from the wandering rose on Instagram. This shirt is Ralph Lauren, but I got it, um, thrifted at my local thrift store pants, local thrift store, um, bracelet gift from my mother. And it was a gift from my father to her. So technically I got it second hands. <laughs> I actually follow, like I was saying, I follow a lot of older ladies who, um, they post basically the reason I went into my thrift fit is cause they post like thrifted fits. And so they post like vintage fits. And I just see myself so much in them. Like when I'm older, like using my sewing machine and having like, you know, sewing like vintage secondhand pieces together. Cause I'm such a secondhand girly. And I really care about sustainability. That's another video though. But anyway, I follow these older women who are in their 60s and in their 70s. And, you know, 
they're on TikTok and they're cool and they're like so funky and cool and like talented and have these really cool hobbies and just like really cool wonderful women and I look online and I would I it honestly broke my heart to think of the fact that they're going online and seeing thousands of people take videos of what they currently look like and saying that that is ugly there's thousands of young women taking videos of themselves looking like them right now and saying how they look terrible and they look like they are you know so ugly and that they need all this work done and that you know they look like they're decomposing and that it's terrible why does everybody else get to get made the filter makes them look like they're in their 50s they have to look like they're in their 70s and 80s and why is somebody have gray hair guys this is not right and so we see that when we view ourselves this way we also innately view the other women who are actually in that space of their life that way that's not right that's not normal even it's common but it's not nor that's not it shouldn't be the norm that's not natural it's common but it's not natural that is not our natural way of existing that is not natural us to literally degrade women as they get older and view them from this space is not natural and we're very disconnected and as a result we have these very messed up ways of viewing ourselves and others and it's not okay so i don't want to live in that world i hope that you guys don't want to live in that world either and let's just change the way that we view ourselves and start to rewire the way that our brains work about ourselves and as we do that we heal the world because then we do not view our daughters that way we do not view our grandmothers that way or we view them in an empowering space we see them for the truth of who they are and for the reflection of the divine that they are and yeah so that is what I wanted to share with you guys today and I hope that was helpful and I love you guys. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope that this was a helpful video for you guys and I'm really excited to start my, where I've like started my YouTube journey like 20 million times but I only have like five or six videos and now I'm starting for real. So I will see you guys soon. I'll see you in my next video and yeah, talk to you soon. Bye!